Oh, he's coming. Okay. Oh, he's here. Okay, so, good. Hi. for coming and goodbye. Well, first of all, I have to apologize. I have a uh, cold, apparently, and my voice is doing weird stuff, so I'm going to sound awkward during the talk. Um, okay, my name is Sebastian König. I have a little studio in Leipzig where I'm doing a little bit of VFX, a little bit of um, Blender stuff as a freelancer. So I'm using Blender professionally. <clears throat> so I'm a professional. Um, maybe who of you used the tracking tool in Blender already? Okay, who didn't? Who has no idea how to use it? Uh, okay. Well, you're out of luck because um, <laughs> even, though, even though this is a workshop, I'm not going to work that much. Um, and I'm not going to explain a lot about tracking. I'm more interested in showing a new, few new features and some workflow enhancements and some tools that I wrote or tried to write. Um, okay, so maybe first as a little introduction, uh, VFX is usually and unfortunately not really about placing robots or spaceships in clips. It's more about removing crap from footage, like the actor had a pimple, or something in the face, or the crew forget to, forgets to put the lighting equipment out of the shot, or some crap in the, in the shot. That's very common, and, and, and that's, that's what usually, at least in my case, what VFX is all about, removing crap from footage. It's very unexciting, and you Ideally, you don't see it in the end. So, if you if you're going to show off your work, then you say, "Here, that's that's my work." And he says, "Yeah, there's nothing in it." Exactly. <laughs> that's the point. Yeah, but okay. So the thing is that for these retouching jobs, there's more or less always the same, or at least a very similar workflow. And if you're doing a lot of these things in a row, then you start to think, "Yeah." This could be a little bit more streamlined. Blender is nice, but it's also very crappy if you do the same thing over and over again, because Blender is so versatile and so broad that it's not optimized for specific workflows. So if you don't optimize Blender for your own work for workflows, then you're doing it wrong. And I was doing it wrong for a very long time. So I finally started to to get a little bit into Python to be able to make Blender a little bit more streamlined for certain things. Um, so in my studio there's a colleague of mine, he's working on a Da Vinci color grading suite, you know, the nice buttons and balls where you can do the color correction and it's super awesome and the, the software works great. It's really streamlined and optimized for workflows like color grading, drawing mask, attaching a mask to a clip, moving the clip around, uh, doing things very efficiently and very in a very nice manner. In, in Blender, if you have to if you want to assign a mask for example, and then you have to go to the compositor, choose the mask, get the mask, clip, then go back to the movie clip editor and, and do all that stuff that is really annoying. <clears throat> Excuse me. So part of my talk will be uh, showing a few tools that I I'm trying to work on to, to improve the situation. Um, first of all, though, <clears throat> a little bit, little bit of the new developments in the Blender tracking tool in the movie clip editor. So I'm just going to demo a few things. Um, for example, how you can not open a shot. Oh yeah, by r clicking the right buttons you come to this panel and you can open up footage. <clears throat> for example, um, which one? This one, for example. <clears throat> so, the first thing is the new full screen mode in Blender, which is very nice, thanks Dalai. 
So everything is gone and that's like really nice because you're not distracted. And then the thing is, let me go out of that again, uh, starting to track you always have to do a couple of things like prefetch it into the memory, um, set the number of frames and all that kind of stuff so you, you're always fiddling with all these things and all these buttons and they are all over the place and now we have the tabs so you have to go into the tabs and search for the stuff you, that you use. So this is so much nicer because you don't see anything um, but thanks to the new Pi menus, thanks to um, Sci-Fi, uh, we, we can just do that and uh, have like a very clean interface and if you want to use a tool pew, then you have your Pi menus at least if you you have to write them yourself currently. So the, the functionality is there, but it's actually quite easy to to put tools into the Pi so they can so you can use it from there. So that's <clears throat> I've been working on these Pi menus for tracking since a few weeks already, and I realized that optimizing workflows can take a lot of time, like trying to optimize the tools really for certain workflows. So it's an ongoing project to do that. But anyway, so that's Pi menus. It's very useful. Um, <clears throat> and then, if you, if I want to track this shot, maybe let's first have a look at that. So there is this thing in the middle, and it would be nice to to have the geometry. Maybe we want to light a fire there. So the first thing that we need to do is to track, obviously, the camera. So now that I'm in this clean setup, I don't have my tracking buttons and I can't remember the tracking shortcuts, but I can remember at least three letters, like W, Q, E, I can remember those. So I have all my tracking tools on these buttons in the Pi menus, so I can track this marker now, starting from this frame. Um, apparently not really. No, there, there we go, okay. So these, these, these tracking pies that I've been working on, they are especially for tracking, like really, I think they are very useful because you have to track in a certain direction, track forward, track backward, go to frame one, go to frame, go to the end frame. So the, the Pi menus, by the way, who, who used the Pi menus already? You tried it, okay. So the way that these work is um, you, you launch the Pi menu and then you can just, while you launch it, you can drag with your mouse into a certain direction and that will then trigger this command, so I don't have to click there. So if I know I want to track forward, I just press E and drag in the direction that I want to track. So it would be, uh, if I go to frame one again, like a uh, place, ugh, come on, this is such a tiny interface. Yeah, I click and drag in that direction. If I want to track backwards, I click again and drag in the opposite direction. So I can very quickly place my markers on places where I want them to have, uh, where I want them to be, and then they pretty much do what I want. So, um, one of the things that I also usually do is to uh, switch between certain types of motion models. So, if you have like an easy shot, you probably get away with the default setup if you only track the location of one point. But if you have um, a moving camera, then usually the um, the feature that you're tracking is deforming in space. And in that case, it would be nice if the marker would do the same movement, so that the feature is looking the same to the tracker. In that case, you can use affine tracking. <coughs> Sorry. And usually, you would have to go to the track panel, do the tracking settings, go to the menu, click there, no, there, and then um, choose the option, which is great. I mean, this is a, a tidy interface, sort of, so everything is put into little boxes, and if you know what you want to do, you just say, oh yeah, oh, I want to do it in that box, and then you grab the tool. So it's, you, you can find it. If, you, if it's a little bit logical, uh, organized, then you can find the stuff. But that's not great for a quick workflow. So if I know that I switch between location and affine a lot, then I can just put these two options into a pie menu, uh, and can drag to the left, then it's location-based. If I drag to the right, it's affine tracking. So this is now using um, if I do that, it's now using affine tracking. So I can track this forward 
And here it's not so apparent, but if I track something on the floor and set it to affine, then it's going to deform with the footage. And that's going to stick much better to the floor, because uh, the feature is very precise, as you can see here. So it, it's looking all the same all the time, because the feature is being distorted together with the footage. OK, currently I have to do this over and over again. Um, but it would be nice if I could say, this is my new preset. So what I can do is to <coughs> launch my Pi menu and say, this setting is now the new default. So I can just drag in a certain direction, and now this will be my new preset. It's a little bit too, too big, though. So I can now track that again, and it's using affine tracking. Um, Another thing that, that is something that you commonly have to do is to uh, clear a path of a certain track. Because looking at this one, you can see once it touches the, the border of this thing, it starts to slide away because uh, there's something getting in the way, and this is not what you need. So I can either go to the frame and then go out of full screen mode, go to the track button, clear in that direction, or I launch my track pi and drag in a certain direction and it will clear the path from there to the end. And this is still too big. So this is very nice for a workflow and it makes everything faster. Um, and once we have eight, at least eight markers, we can then start to solve the shot, which usually usually would mean that we have to switch the tab to the solve tab, then search for the tools, or we just say shift S for solve, and then we have the solving pie, where we can first enable refinement, so that Blender is automatically figuring out the focal length or the uh, distortion parameters, whatever we want. We can, we can launch that from the pie menu, and then solve the camera. Oh, at first we have to set the keyframes. And this is also in the in the tracking solver pie. So solving the camera will give us in this case a solve error of 0 0.3, which is really nice. But in 3D view, I still can't see anything of that. So therefore I have my reconstruction pie. So I can first grab three markers on the floor and maybe these ones and say set up a floor plane maybe track even one more marker here quickly track that not taking very long then after that I have to solve again um, and now I can say this is the origin this is the y-axis, and now I'm going to set up my tracking scene. And if I now look through the camera, like everything's there. So, and if you want to do this very quickly, you can do this in, in a minute or so. And I can even render that and have a working composite because of the way the setup tracking scene works, because it's setting up an entire node setup for me. Okay, so that went well, sort of. Now I could modify this even more so that the geometry also fits a little bit better to the scene. Oh, we don't need that. So we have a floor plane now. And the next thing that would be nice to have is um, a model that looks similar to this geometry. Now we can model that, or we can let Blender model that by tracking a point cloud. And the point cloud tracking, um, we, we could just place markers there and track those and then solve everything. But if you solve a scene with many markers, then the solving will be very slow. And if the markers are not doing what you need them to do, then it will mess up your entire solution. So you would have to do it all over again. But if you use zero weighted markers, you can just very easily place markers there. They don't even have to be accurate. They can do something. It's not that important. 
uh, they should at least track a little bit of your of your footage, but it's not going to mess up your solution. So because I'm now going to add many more markers, I'm going to lock these ones so that they are not tracked again. And I'm going to hide them with H, and then I'm going to first set up one marker, maybe very small, even with a smaller search area, so that it's tracking very fast. And in the in the current blender, uh, the, the pre-pass, which is a certain way of uh, for tracking a feature, so you pre-pass, uh, it, it's a brute force algorithm to, to try to match the marker to the previous frame. Um, this is going to take long, at least if you have very much, well, a lot of markers, then it can take very long. So I want to turn it off, and since I'm still ideally working in the clean full screen, I want to uh, do that with my tracking setup buttons. So I can just launch the Pi menu for that and disable prepass. And you notice that it's that the Pi menus are very flexible, so you can also place your your own icons in them, and you can make the icons respond to to the setting. So if the prepass is disabled, it's going to show a different icon than if the prepass is enabled. So now it's on, and the I don't know if you can see that the checkbox is activated. Okay, and then the 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 this is taking way too much screen space here, the, the marker. So I'm going to change the marker display with a nested Pi menu that I have here available in my display setup. So I can just launch a second Pi menu and dis disable the pattern area and the search area so that I only have this little dot, which is enough for me, because I know that there is a marker. So now I want to automatically set up a bunch of markers. And I can do that with Detect Features, which is, maybe I should quickly enable the pattern so that you can see something. So Detect Features is something that you can use to automatically place many markers in your footage, and um, that's a nice starting point. However, in this case, I only need them to be here in this area, so I can use the last operator and modify first a few things. So with a lower threshold, I have many, many, many markers, but I only want them to be in a certain area. So actually, I have to do it again, because first I want to draw a grease pencil line around the area where I'm going to... I'm sorry for that, that's, uh, <laughs> that's unintentional. Um, so I'm quickly going to detect features again, and then say, Damn it. Just do it inside of the grease pencil. And I can even lower the parameters even more. So that's that's really many markers. By the way, Sergey, it would be nice if it would also detect them here. So you, there could be a, a constant or a contrast threshold thing. Yeah, so, yeah, okay, so I'm going to add them myself. So I'm going to add all these features because I want to have a point cloud there. Okay, so that's, yeah, go ahead. Um, the thing is, I forgot something. Because all these markers, they still have a weight of one. and. We, we don't have an operator to copy the settings from the active marker to the other markers. We only have a setting to copy the settings from the active marker to the preset. Well, we do. If you, if you know Python, then you can do everything you want. So I scripted my own operator to copy the track settings to, from the active track to all the selected tracks. Uh, of course, I still have to set the weight. Um, so if I do that, then all of them have now a weight of zero. So I can track them, which is going to take a while, because there are quite a few, and it's not working.
So that's that's a little bit unfortunate. Um, it can be because Blender sometimes sucks with movie files. Sometimes it can help to just reload your clip and reload it into the RAM. And sometimes it's doing it better, but not in this case. Yeah, see? Yeah, it should do it automatically. Anyway, it's it's quite slow. So, oh, and they all use the prepass. Sorry. So I turn this off and copy the no, copy the settings and track again. And now it's faster. Okay, that's going to take a little bit, not too much. <clears throat> I don't know really. It's weird, right? It's, it's really, really strange. Ah, it's because it's master. Master is just slow. There's no magic inside this. Okay, this maybe this is already enough. So the, the thing with the zero weighted markers is that you can just track a few frames, <coughs> solve this again, and solving is very fast. You still have the identical solve error but still you have a point cloud here and you can use this point cloud by reconstructing a mesh from the markers and I have to hide all these ones but there I have a mesh unfortunately it's just points and I had to search a little bit through the internet to find a script that will convert these at least some of these to something that kind of resembles a mesh or like with faces so um, first I have to rename this yeah that, that's crappy yeah yeah I can I could drop a plane from above and then project to vertex but it's not really working great um, I, I'm going to try this um, Right. Oh, and there we go, of course. Okay. Eh. I have no idea. <laughs> Something. It's the, yeah. So, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Yeah, it's not working. That's the demo effect. At least it's easy to blame the demo effect for it. Yeah, it's not working. I'm sorry, I can't demo it. So imagine you have a mesh there. <laughs> oh, you have a tiny mesh. Maybe we can do it like this. Just do. Yeah. 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 You can. You can still. If I, if I save this, I can still do this and. Convex, yeah, con no, convex hull can't do cavities or like all these things. Um, I have to make a little bit. Yeah, it would work with points only, I think. Yeah, but okay, so you get that. So you have a smoke and then you composite and you're happy and then everything's fine. So that was just a one demo. Um, of how you can optimize your workflow with Pi menus. <clears throat> but then, if you if you can use Python to write Pi menus, then you can also use Python. You use Python to do other things. Like for example, um, I'm going to just open a new file and quickly track one other shot, um, which is this one. Yes. Okay. So, another a very common problem with uh, the feature detection is that not only does it hang for some reason, That and that. Um.
Okay, tracking feature detection. Okay, there we go. So tracking many features will inevitably result to jumping markers. You, you see that here and somewhere else, and that is very bad because jumping markers will destroy your camera solution. And then, I mean, you, you can clean this up by hand, like going through all these things. But then I thought, yeah, if Blender can, if I can see the spikes, then probably some math can also see spikes. And I, I really suck at math. I'm really like dumb as bread when it comes to uh, to <laughs> math. But but uh, yeah, like just comparing two frames and then building an average between some values, I, that's something that I still managed. So there's one tool that I wrote also for the tracking pies, is that you can just filter the tracks and erase the, the bad tracks and then you're left with only clean curves. So you can um, quickly uh, set up um, a camera solution with a solid error of 0 0.2 and set up a tracking scene and then you're basically done at least if you orient it, maybe. Okay, so, so that's like you, you can have a camera track in 20 seconds with composites. So. <laughs> Although, I assume that in a few weeks or months we will have this automatically done by Blender itself, right, Sergei? Okay, uh, in the beginning I was talking about that uh, VFX means that you have to do retouching a lot. So there's one more thing that I want to demo and that is a little bit optimized retouching workflow. So let's say you have uh, a shot with some people in it that you want to get rid of, at least some of them. Um, now it's crashing. Ah, no. Um, 50 okay. okay so the the lady with pink with a, a turquoise sh shirt can stay in the shot but the other people should just go away they 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 don't fit there so you want to get rid of them so first you need something to make your camera fit to the scene like usually you do and uh, in this shot even though i was moving the camera this is this has been shot obviously from high above with a, a zoom lens or very much zoomed in uh, a long lens as you would say uh, so it doesn't matter if there's parallax or not you can just use a tripod solver so I pretty much only need to track a few spots in the scene um, like so, and that should go very fast. And one of them, this one stops a little bit too early because it touches the frame border, but I can offset it to another place and then keep on tracking that. Um, <clears throat> and since I want to see if the markers are doing the right thing, I quickly mute the footage with my display pie, mute footage. So yeah, that looks that looks all right. Okay, so then I will set up a tripod solver by using my solving pi down there, and then I also want to. Oh no! In this case, I want to set the focal length myself. So I'm just going to set it to 200 because this is about the the actual length of my lens. Uh, so I'm just going to solve this. And the solve error is 0 0.4, which is good enough. So I'm going to set up a tracking scene. And um, I have to zoom out a little bit. And if you have a tripod shot, then there's no 3D information. There's no uh, way to align this automatically. But a tripod motion will stick to anything. You can do whatever you want. So I can just rotate the camera to around the 3D cursor and try to somehow make it fit a little bit to the scene and it's not really 
that important. It just has to fit a little bit. Maybe like that. And because it's just like a tripod motion, it will stick to whatever I do with the camera. Okay, so maybe the cube can go into the hidden mode. Maybe also these crosses are a little bit too big, so I'm going to go into the motion tracking panel and make those a little bit too uh, smaller, like that. So, and what I want to achieve now is to, to get rid of the people. So I need a clean plate. A clean plate means a plate that's clean, like an image without the stuff that I don't need. And I'm going to use the, the background layer for that. So uh, first I'm just going to align this with the motion or with the, with the scene. So in all these places where I have people walking around where I don't need them, I want to have a plane that is covering them. Something like that. <coughs> Sorry. So usually what I would have to do now is to, to unwrap the plane, assign a UV project modifier. Oh, first I have to subdivide the plane. Then I have to project this, bake it, load it into a new material. And if I do that three times in a row, I'm really pissed because it's... Why? I mean, it's pointless. So, ideally, you... <laughs> now, it's not a pie menu, but it's, uh, it's, in this case, it's a button. So first, I'm just going to project this onto, onto a plane. And after that, I want to get rid of the people. So I'm going to into texture paint mode. Oops. And can then just paint them away. Oops. And I have to be careful if I paint while Blender is animating, it's going to crash. Someone might want to look into that. <laughs> it's not a bug. It's not probably not even designed to do that. Um, OK. <laughs> There's going to be a report then. Like that. And then for the rest, um, I can just switch to, to stamp mode or to, the, to another clone tool where I can maybe go into another mode and go into background. So I'm just going to clone from itself. Let's clone from over there. And this shot is, I mean, it's of course, that's very nice for that because it's, you can just clone from everywhere because it's looking all the same. And, oops. Yeah, okay. Whatever, you get the idea like that. Um, something like that. And then, uh, 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 looks okay, that's good enough. Okay. Oh, and forgot to load the correct script, so I have to... Oh, yes, what? Um, I was... Um, I was projecting the movie, and then I switched to clone from self. There's the button clone from image, okay. and the image is the footage that is running in the background. The footage. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. And by the way, this is on my first DVD. I was, oh no, actually it was on, on uh, Tears of Steel DVD. I was talking about how bad it is because you have to, if you have the background images set to movie clip, and you want to have the you want to paint in full screen mode you can't do that because the image is not updating turns out if you set the move the background images to image then it is forced to update so you always have the correct frame what did you I, I i think i did even it's not a bug it's just by design but don't if you have an image uh, an image sequence loaded somewhere as an image data block and you play back, then of course you don't want it to update on each frame because everything would slow down. So you need something that forces an update of the image data block. 
So if I'm in full screen mode and have no open image with that sequence, it's not going to update. But if I set the image to background Im or the background images to that image, there's a user of the image that is forcing the update. So it, it kind of makes sense. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I was complaining to some of you on IRC, and you told me, no, 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 that's, that's design. Who was that? Maybe even Ton. I don't know. That's not about multi-pressor. Anyway, it's working. It's, it's fine. Um, I was going to say something. Oh, yeah. Um, then, of course, you, if you want to render that, you would have to modify the, your node setup. <laughs> And of course, you can just do that automatically with Python, so that you can just render that, and it will like do everything for you. But we are not done yet, because um, I said that I wanted to only mask out the people here, and not this woman. So I want to mask out her with a mask that is obviously following the footage. So I can go to mask mode now and draw a mask around the area that I want to replace everything. But if I play back now, it's, well, going to slide away. So I could either parent this to just one marker, which might lead to bad results because there might be some perspective shift, maybe not in this shot because it's tripod. But what you can do is to have a plane track that is tracking any plane in your in your footage, and if you oops, if you use a plane track, then it will deform with the motion of your of your tracks. So it will be actually like a plane on your plane in the footage, which I can then use to to parent this mask to. So now is the mask is deforming with that plane track. And um, I could even go to preview mode. Like so, this is the mask. And then you want to feather that a little bit. And then all you need to do is to, oh well, all you need to do is a little bit, but well, you have to do a little bit uh, of things. You have to add the mask in, and then you have to combine it with the alpha, which is now at this point a little bit annoying because it's not elegant. Um, now you have to multiply that mask like that, and you have to invert that first, like so, and then you have to set the alpha, and you have to pre-multiply. Okay, but then it's working. So then you can use the mask to to do that kind of stuff. Of, of obviously, what I have to I have to re-render now every frame to see the correct result because the texture that is masking out these people is coming from the 3D viewport. So it would be much more convenient if I could use the plane track to paint on the plane track. Right, Sergey? Yeah. Let's have have a plane track and make it possible to paint on the plane track because it would be amazing. Oh, I no, nah, well, no, nah, that's, that's a good question. Maybe you could map it to the 3D viewport. Like, have a plane track and make it automatically be a plane in the 3D view. Yeah, See? Thank you, okay. <laughs> good. Okay. Okay, but the thing is that um, for for these kind of shots, you, you also want to have some color correction, usually. So, in that case, you would have to have, like, RGB curves, and I'm going to do a quick re-render. So to correct something here, and um, often <clears throat> you only want to have these color corrections only in a certain spot of your footage. So you need a mask again. Well, I made it easy to just press Control M to add a mask to the node, and then um, I can double click that mask node, and I'm already in the new mask data block where I can now draw a mask around the area that I want to highlight with a nice feather, and you would see the result immediately. Could also invert the the influence. You notice that currently I have to always switch between the mask editor and the compositor, which also is annoying. But 
if I, uh, in the mask mode, switch with my masking pies to the image editor, then I can see the result here in, like, here. Like, because this is now the viewer node, and the image editor has masking. So I can edit the mask right there with my effect in the image editor node. And that's basically it for, for this workflow. Um, the, I think the, the whole point of this was to try to encourage you to learn Python, basically. That's, uh, that's <laughs> the whole point. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to release these on the Blender Cloud uh, as part of my TrackMatch Blend 2 course. I'm going to work on them, still polish a little bit, but um, I, at some point I will publish these tools because I think the, the, the workflow can be enhanced so much. There's, there's just different workflows for... Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, why not? Yeah, well. I have no commit rights, so maybe I should ask for commit rights. You just submit the, the, the other for every on the GitHub. Yeah. Like yeah, that's not finished enough. That, uh, that can be better. I'm, I'm, I'm still working on that. And first, it's going to be cloud exclusive, right? <laughs> Has to be, we have to do marketing for the Blender cloud. Yeah. Or not. Maybe not. It's Blender, so everything has to be open. No, but really, I mean, th this is. Very, this is made for very specific workflows. But the, really, the, the point is that, that it's very easy to, to, to learn this kind of stuff. You can copy-paste from the entire source code from Blender. There's, most of this stuff was already there in some other form. You just have to copy-paste, change a few lines of code, and then you have your own tools. And this is really awesome, because um, the, the, by, by, I think by, by default, Blender cannot be made for specific workflows. I think the good thing about Blender is that it's so broad and that the, the, the interface allows you to, to form Blender into the tool that you need. But you have to do it, that you have to do it yourself. Or if you have a studio, you have to have, like Bartek, he, he would do it for you. Or you have your, ideally you have your own technical director who can also write your own tools. Now, speaking of writing new tools, um, in the last minutes, I want to show something that Sergei has been writing uh, recently with Kier, um, and that's quite awesome. I'm going to just quit the scene. So I'm just going to demo how crappy the current version of Blender is because it's incredibly slow. Like, for example, if you take this shot here, I'm going to set the frame range to 800. So it's 800 frames, and it's very long, and it's also quite shaky, especially in the end. So this is very, very shaky. So we, we need a very big marker. <coughs> and because it's so shaky, ideally we have a very big search area, and ideally we use affine tracking. And if we do all that, this is going to be really slow. Like if we, I started to track that, we are already at frame four, wow. So this is only going to take like 10 minutes or so, I don't know. But this is current masses, this is what we have right now. So that's boring. So instead, the, the new version of Blender, which I don't know when we are going to have that. Yeah, as, exactly, as soon as possible. So, again, I would set this to 800 frames and prefetch it into the RAM and set up a marker that is incredibly big, like really large, maybe not so large. And it's going to be affine tracking. And, um, and if I track that now, this is like really faster. <laughs> and it is tracking everything. So, Blender is using predictive tracking. 
So Blender is able to look into the future and knows, okay, so if I'm here on this frame, on the next frame, I'm probably there. So let's watch over there for the feature that I'm looking for. So, I mean... It predicts a lot of, like, representation of all the bundles or so. Yeah, but, but it's, it's awesome. So you, you can only use pre prediction for this. So the tracking is actually faster than the playback, which... <laughs> <laughs> So, um, thank you. Um, and uh, I think the time is over, so thank you. Are there questions? Um, so, you, you want us to learn Python and create much, these yeah. wonderful Py menus as you've shown. Yeah. Can you show us your code? I, I have no idea what code for a Py menu looks like. Oh yeah. Well, you, there, there's a template, and uh, if you go to the scripting layer, there is a, in the templates there is for Python there's a UI Py menu, and you basically have just a, a class like you would have for any other panel, and you have layout, so have layout, and then Py, layout menu Py, and then everything that's inside is going to be a, a Py menu. That's like very easy. Um, so in my tracking pies, tracking pies. Well, I have some of my own functions there. That's the special tools, kind of. So somewhere there are the pies. So it's just that you, you have you have a class for the for the pie menu, and then you put your operators inside of that. Easy as cake. Yeah. Exactly. Thanks. Welcome. Piece of pie, yeah. <laughs> well. Okay, then. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.